All right, guys, we're starting chapter six, uh, section one, entitled Inverse Circular Functions or Inverse Trigonometric Functions. Now, to get us started, let's start with our basic uh, sine uh, graph. All right, this is what we did in class together. This is two periods worth. Um, but the main thing I want you to realize is that this function fails the horizontal line test. You remember the horizontal line test? It says that if a horizontal line can be drawn through the graph um, of a function so that it intersects the graph more than once, then the graph is not the graph of a one-to-one -one function. Like for example, if I drew a horizontal line like this, for example, it would cross definitely more than once, right? I'm, I'm highlighting for you, or at least trying to highlight for you, uh, the intersection points. So this fails quite miserably the horizontal line test. And because it fails the horizontal line test, uh, we know that this function is not one-to-one. -one. And if the function is not one-to-one, -one, then um, it does not have an inverse function. So this is the thing, guys. This is what we're going to do for all of our trig functions. In order to discuss and study inverse trig functions or inverse circular functions, we are going to restrict the domain of our functions so as to create a one-to-one -one function. So for sine function, for the sine function, the restriction I want you to consider is from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. I'm highlighting this piece of the graph in blue here. Just look at that piece from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. If we only look at that piece, it will pass the horizontal line test. It will be, this function will be 1 to 1 if we restrict the domain to negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Now look at this. This is what the graph would look like if we restrict, if we restrict the domain between negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Please notice the restricted domain here. It's very important. And the range is still the same between negative 1 to 1. Now, this function with the restricted uh, domain, with the restriction on its domain, is definitely 1 to 1. So now that this will definitely pass the horizontal line test, uh, we do know it's 1 to 1, and its inverse exists. Its inverse function exists. Now, when remember when you're, you were studying inverse functions in algebra, um, the domain of this function becomes your range for, for the inverse. The range of this function becomes the domain of its inverse. In other words, so we know the domain of inverse sine of x will be the same thing as the range for sine of x. Please notice that relationship there. Okay, The range for inverse sine will be the same thing as the restricted domain for sine of x. Okay, so if you know one, it leads you to the other. Okay, now furthermore, remember when we go to graph these functions, uh, inverse functions, remember that if x comma y lives on the graph of a function, then y comma x lives on the graph of its inverse function. In other words, all you got to do is swap the coordinates to get the graph of the inverse function. Now we know how to scale the axes for inverse sine of x because notice that your x-axis for sine of x goes from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. That means the y-axis over here will go from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Okay, so this will be, I'll make this negative pi over 2 and then I'll make this up here positive pi over 2. Okay. Notice that the y-axis over here for sine of x goes from negative 1 to 1. That means the x-axis over here for inverse sine of x will go from negative 1 to 1. So I'll make this negative 1, and I'll make this positive 1, okay? Now, notice what we had said earlier. If x comma y is on the graph of a function, then y comma x is on the graph of its inverse function. So... This ordered pair here has the coordinates negative pi over 2, comma, negative 1. Swap those coordinates. What would you get? You would get negative 1, 
comma negative pi over 2. You would get this point right here with those coordinates. This one's interesting. This is 0, 0. So if you swap the coordinates, it's still 0, 0. So the graph of inverse sine of x goes right through the origin. And then this one here um, has ordered pairs, or I'm sorry, uh, coordinates, excuse me, uh, pi over 2, comma 1. Swap those coordinates, you would get 1, comma pi over 2. So maybe about right here. Another thing I want you to remember about your studies from algebra is that the graphs of a function and its inverse function are always symmetric with respect to the line y equal to x, the identity function. So we know the curve here would have to behave something like that. That would be the graph of y equals sine of x, uh, inverse sine of x. All right. All we did was we um, got the domain and range from the domain and range for sine of x, and then we swapped the coordinates. Instead of negative pi over two, negative one, it's negative one, negative pi over two, and so forth. And then we also got the we got the mirrored image with respect to the line y equal to x. All right, everybody. So then this is what we have for y equal inverse sine of x. Um, just notation purposes, folks, um, if you don't want to write it this way, you can write it as y equal arc sine of x. Arc sine of x is just another way of saying inverse sine of x. Both mean the same thing. So this is what the graph looks like. Um, notice the domain is from negative 1 to 1, and the range, and this is going to be very important, the range is from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Now watch this. This is really important. Um, y equal to inverse sine of x, or y equal to arc sine of x if you'd like. This means that x is sine of y. That is to say, um, y equal to inverse sine of x just means that y is the angle whose sine is x. Did you get that? Uh, y equal to arc sine of x means y is the angle whose sine is x. In other words, y is the angle such that when you take sine of that angle, you get x. That's what this notation means. And that is very, very, very important, that you understand what this notation even means. y equal to arc sine of x or y equal to inverse sine of x just means that y is the angle whose sine is x. Now, but that y value can only come from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So it's very important that when you are giving a value for arc sine of x, uh, that that angle that you are saying, uh, that you are giving as your answer, is inside of this interval. So this is very, very important. Let's look at an example, and I think it'll make better sense for us, okay? Um, notice um, that this y value, though, before we actually go to the example, notice that this y value here basically covers quadrant 1 and 4, doesn't it? So these are the only two quadrants uh, from which you can state your y value, quadrant between quadrant 4 and quadrant 1. All right, everybody? So like um, if you were to look like on a unit circle, right? Like this. It's an ugly circle, but you get the idea. Uh, your answer can only come between quadrant one and quadrant four. All right, everybody? Remember that when you give an answer for arc sine of x. All right, let's look at our first, first example. Okay, find the exact value of this expression for y. So solve for y. y equals arc sine of x. Excuse me, y equals arc sine of root three over two. y equals arc sine of root three over two. Now, I taught you on in just a minute ago that this means that y is the angle whose sine is root 3 over 2. In other words, if you take sine of y, you will get root 3 over 2. That's another way to rewrite the given expression. Okay, everybody? y equals arc sine of root 3 over 2 means that y is the angle whose sine value is root 3 over 2. Okay, cool. Now, look at this. Um, your value here is positive or negative? 
positive. So then is your y value, is that angle going to be an angle in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4? It can't be quadrant 4. If y is in quadrant 4, sine of an angle that's in quadrant 4 would be negative. And because you're getting positive, y is going to have to come from quadrant 1. Okay, everybody? So y must come from uh, quadrant 1. y is in quadrant 1. And because you and I know our unit circle so well, we know that y must be pi over 3. Pi over 3 is the angle whose sine value is root 3 over 2. Cool, we're done with this problem, but I just want to highlight something really quickly. There is another angle um, on the unit circle whose sine value is root 3 over 2. So I want you to look at this. Sine of 2 pi over 3 is also positive root 3 over 2. Right? So somebody may say, well, I can give the answer of 2 pi over 3 because sine of 2 pi over 3 is also root 3 over 2. The problem is y equal to 2 pi over 3 is not in the range for arc sine of x. Remember that the range for arc sine of x is only negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. You can only choose an angle that is from quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. The reason of that is because of the restricted domain that we had for sine of x. So 2 pi over 3 is outside of the range for arc sine of x. So because 2 pi over 3 is not within the range for arc sine of x, we cannot give this answer uh, 2 pi over 3. It's not allowed. So this here is not allowed to be said, okay? 2 pi over 3 is not your answer. Although sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2, um, 2 pi over 3 is not within the range. So you got to be very careful that your answer is within the range for that inverse uh, trig function. Let's go to the next example. Okay, we have y is equal to inverse sine of negative 1 half. Okay, so I taught you how you can rewrite this to mean that sine of y is negative 1 half. Okay, y is the angle whose sine is negative 1 half. Now, I want to just um, bring to your attention really quickly that there are two quadrants in which sine has negative function values. Two quadrants where sine is negative. Quadrant number uh, three, okay, or quadrant number four. Now, quadrant number three is not allowed to uh, be considered because remember the range for inverse sine of x is only between negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. I know I'm repeating this a lot, but uh, I think it's important. Um, you're only allowed to give an answer in quadrant 1 or 4, okay, not quadrant 3. Now, because they gave you, uh, because they gave you a negative uh, value here, you know you're going to have to be in quadrant 4, not quadrant 1. Okay, so we're going to give an answer in quadrant 4. Okay, so because we know our unit circle so well, we know that y is uh, equal to, uh, let's say, 11 pi over 6. Check your unit circle. You'll find that sine of 11 pi over 6 uh, is negative 1 half. And not only does this value, 11 pi over 6, satisfy this statement, um, 11 pi over 6 is in quadrant 4. It seems like everything is good, right, everybody? It seems like we have our answer, but there's still something wrong. Watch this. We know that the answer must be inside the range for inverse sine of x. That is to say, y must be inside this interval, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. That is to say, y has to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. The problem is that 11 pi over 6 is not inside this interval. 11 pi over 6 is much larger than pi over 2. 11 pi over 6 is not less than or equal to pi over 2, right? So then 11 pi over 6 is not inside this interval. So what I'm going to do is I am going to give a coterminal angle, um, Instead, so instead of 11 pi over 6, coterminal would be 
negative pi over 6. This is my answer. Negative pi over 6 is inside of this interval, and it is a little bit uh, it's, uh, bigger than negative pi over 2. Negative pi over 6 is greater than negative pi over 2, and it is less than or equal to pi over 2. So, and it's in quadrant 4. So we cannot give 11 pi over 6 as the answer because it's not inside the range for inverse sine of x. Negative pi over 6, which is coterminal with 11 pi over 6, is within the range for inverse sine of x. So this is our answer. So that was a little tricky. You have to be very careful that your answer is inside the range for that inverse trig function. Okay, let's push forward. Okay, example 1, part C. This is the last part for example 1. Y is equal to inverse sine of root 2. Now, before you go to rewrite this, can you flip back in your notes and look at what the domain for inverse sine is? You're right, the domain is negative 1 to positive 1. Wait a minute. Um, if that's the case, root 2 is not within this domain. So you're not allowed to plug in this value into this function because root 2 is greater than 1. Root 2 is outside of the domain. Therefore, this whole thing does not exist. S uh, inverse sine of root 2 does not exist. It's kind of like saying it's undefined. All right, so be very careful. Don't do you know, more work than you should here. Hopefully you catch that early. Okay, guys, that's um, inverse sine of x or arc sine of x. Um, now I want us to go to cosine, the cosine function. Let's start with the most basic graph for cosine, and then we'll restrict the domain just like we did for sine of x. Okay, you've seen this before. This is cosine of x, right? Two periods worth. Um, this is the basic parent graph for cosine of x we did in class together. Once again, uh, the story is the same. This is not a one-to-one -one function. We know that for sure because it fails the horizontal line test, right? So its inverse function fails to exist. There is no inverse function unless you and I restrict the domain, okay? So then what we'll do then is what we did for sine of x. We'll restrict the domain for cosine of x so that we do have something one-to-one. -one. We do have something that passes the horizontal line test. So then this is the restriction that I will consider, or I'll ask you to consider, from um, x equal to zero to x equal to pi. From uh, that segment there in blue, just over that restricted domain, this function will be one-to-one. -one. This function will have an inverse. All right, guys, this is what we have, y equal to cosine of x with um, the restricted domain. Um, this is definitely one-to-one. -one. You know that because it'll, you can see that it'll pass the horizontal line test. So the restricted domain is now from 0 to pi only, okay, 0 to pi. And then uh, the range is still negative 1 to positive 1. Now, remember, these two things are, I mean, it's, this is really, really, really important because um, this, uh, let's see, this range right here will become the domain or it will be the domain for inverse cosine. This domain right here will be the range for inverse cosine. So it's really important that we get this right. So here we go, y equal to arc cosine of x, or y equal to inverse cosine of x. Um, you know, I know how to set up my axes because I notice the y-axis goes from negative 1 to 1. That means my x-axis will go from negative 1 to 1 for arc cosine. Um, I notice that the, um, the, the um, x-axis over here goes from 0 to pi. That means the y-axis over here will go from 0 to pi for arc cosine, right? Furthermore, we talked earlier on how the domain for arc cosine will be the same thing as the range for cosine. And the range, and this is really important, the range for arc cosine will be the same thing as the restricted domain for cosine of x.
And then when we were graphing inverse sine, we were saying how we just need to swap the coordinates, right? So if this is 0, 1, that means we're going to get 1, 0 over here, right? If this is the point pi over 2, comma, 0, then over here we're going to get 0, comma, pi over 2, which I failed to label. 0, comma, pi over 2, like that. If this is the point pi comma negative 1, right, pi comma negative 1, then over here we're going to get negative 1 pi. So it's like that. And then we also said how the graph is always um, symmetric with respect to the line y equal to x, the identity function. So my graph for inverse cosine of x looks like this. Okay, now again, this is really important um, here. If you just want to highlight it, make sure you have it correct. The range for our cosine is 0 to pi. Okay, um, one more time, um, I am going to say that y equal to inverse cosine of x means that x is equal to cosine of y. I'll say it another way. Y equal to inverse cosine of X means that Y is the angle whose cosine is X. Really important that you understand that Y can only come or only be between 0 and pi. 0 and pi. And when you think about your unit circle, if Y is between 0 and pi, that, mean, that means Y is either coming from quadrants 1 or... 2. Correct, everybody? So when we look at our example right now for uh, our cosine of x or inverse cosine of x, remember that your final answer for that angle must be in either quadrant 1 or quadrant 2, meaning quadrant 3 and quadrant 4 are off limits. All right, cool. Example 2. Find the exact value of y if y is equal to o uh, y is equal to arc cosine of zero. All right, cool. Now we know that we can rewrite this to mean that y is the angle whose cosine is zero. All right. Now between zero and pi, the only uh, value for y on the unit circle whose cosine is zero is pi over two. So y must be pi over 2, because pi over 2 is the only angle whose cosine is 0, between 0 and pi, that is. Now, that's our final answer, but I do want to bring something up to your attention. This right here. Um, cosine of 3 pi over 2 is also 0. So somebody may think, well... My answer could be 3 pi over 2. That's not true. Although 3 pi over 2 uh, does have its cosine value at 0, right? 3 pi over 2 is outside of the range for cosine. So we know 3 pi over 2 cannot be given as an answer. All right? It's very dangerous because, it, you know, if you look at your unit circle, you may think, oh, I, got, I have two answers. Well, you only have one that falls within the range for our cosine of x. Okay, let's look at our next example. y is equal to inverse cosine of 1 half. Now, if you remember, we said that the range for our cosine is uh, 0 to pi, meaning quadrants 1 or 2. Now, in quadrant 1, cosine is positive. In quadrant 2, cosine is negative. This number right here is positive one half. That must mean that y is not in quadrant two, but rather in quadrant one. Okay, so we know our answer must be in quadrant one. So then uh, we can rewrite this if you'd like as cosine of something, cosine of some angle is one half. In quadrant one, the angle whose cosine is one half is pi over three. That's your final answer. Okay. Now, uh, I, I know you, I, you, at this point, you may be really clear about this, but I just want to make sure that, <laughs> that I'm just driving home the point over and over again. Um, 5 pi over 3 in quadrant number uh, 4 um, also has a cosine value of 1 half. 
but this value cannot be given as an answer because this value is not within the range for cosine. Excuse me, it's not within the range for inverse cosine or arc cosine, all right? Okay, guys, moving on to tangent of x. This is um, the graph for tangent of x. And if we restrict the domain for tangent to be just between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, then we will have a graph that passes the horizontal line test, and therefore um, it is one-to-one -one and it has an inverse function. Let's, so let's restrict the domain for tangent to be negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Okay, the range is, of course, all real numbers. Um, I just want to highlight something. These are parentheses on the endpoints here of this interval because that's where your vertical asymptotes are located. Okay, so I think we have everything we need in order to get the graph of inverse tangent. Okay, so y is equal to inverse tangent of x or arc tangent of x. First of all, notice that because tangent of x has vertical asymptotes at negative pi over 2, and positive pi over 2, arctangent of x will have horizontal asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, okay? And then, um, notice that you have these points over here. Of course, the origin 0, 0. But this point right here on the curve is pi over 4, 1. And this is negative pi over 4, negative 1, about right there. That means over here on arctangent of x, you're going to get... Um, let's see, pi over 4, 1, you're going to get 1 pi over 4. The origin will still be the origin. And instead of negative pi over 4, negative 1, you'll get negative 1, negative pi over 4. So something like this. So then your curve has to uh, behave something like that. Hey, that was pretty nice, okay, if I can say so myself. So then um, all we have left to... Uh, notate for our notes is the domain and range for arctangent of x. But we'll just get that information right here from the domain, the restricted domain that is, and the range for tangent of x. All right, cool. So then this is what we have. This is y equal to inverse tangent of x, or if you'd like, y equal to arctangent of x. Cool. Let's go forward. Let's go to example number three. Okay, guys, example three. Find the exact degree measure. Uh, for theta equal to arctan of root 3. All right, let's go. We know that this can be rewritten to mean tangent of theta is root 3. Okay, do you remember what we just finished writing for the range for arctan? If you need to like flip in your notes or something, like flip a page or whatever, that's fine. But you're going to find that the range for arctangent is uh, negative pi over 2, to positive pi over 2. That means quadrant 1 or 4. Now look at this value here. This value is positive, so that means theta has to be between, uh, that has to be in quadrant 1. So we have these two options as quadrants. Quadrant 4 is out automatically because they gave me a positive number, so we do know that it has to be quadrant 1 for sure. Okay, now because you and I are so well versed in in especially quadrant one of our unit circle. We know that theta has to be uh, exactly 60 degrees. Um, this is the angle whose tangent is root three. Good job. Okay, let's do another one. Okay, that's better. Okay, theta is equal to inverse tangent of negative one. Now, let's go back to our conversation about the range for inverse tangent. Um, the range for inverse tangent is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Again, that means your um, options for theta have to come from quadrants 1 or 4. Um, notice what they gave you here. They gave you a negative 1 as the value. So therefore, quadrant 1 is completely out. It's going to have to be quadrant 4 here that you look, in, uh, look into for um, theta. Okay, now... We know that this statement can be re rewritten to mean tangent of theta is negative 1, okay? And because we know our unit circle very well, we know that tangent of 45 degrees, which is, of course, I know 45 degrees is in quadrant 1, but just hear me out. Tangent of 45 degrees is 1. If you want negative 1, then consider... Um, 
45 degrees to be your reference angle. And in quadrant four, that would put you at 315 degrees, right? Now, that's cool. Now, tangent of, now a couple things here, and this is not my final answer, right? But I just wanna bring this up to your attention. Very similar to the other example. Tangent of 315 degrees is negative one. Check your unit circle, that's true. What's also true is 315 degrees is in quadrant four. The only problem here is that 315 degrees is not between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. I'll say it like this. Negative 315 degrees is not between negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees. So just like you did in the other example, get a coterminal angle with 315 degrees, but a coterminal angle that is between negative 90 and positive 90 degrees. I hope you're thinking about negative 45 degrees. Negative 45 degrees is coterminal with 315 degrees, so it's still gonna be negative one as its tangent value, but the thing is negative 45 is within the range for arc tangent. All right, so that's very important. Okay, very good guys, let's continue working here. Okay guys, these are the, the three remaining inverse trig functions. Um, they're all defined similarly, um, where you start with cotangent of x, you start with secant of x and cosecant of x, and you make those restrictions on their domain so that you have something one-to-one, -one, and then you can get its inverse uh, function. So all of these um, three last um, inverse trig functions are derived the same kind of way we did sine, cosine, and, and tangent, all right? So these are their graphs. Um, let me write down their domain and range, uh, f the domain and range for each one for you as well. Okay, here it is. Uh, the last three uh, inverse trig functions with their domains and their ranges, okay? Now, again, um, it's very important that you re recall this information, but especially if I can just highlight one more time um, the ranges, okay? And as a matter of fact, can you, in, um, on your own time, can you look at uh, page, please see page uh, 259. If you look at this page in your textbook, there's a table. It's entitled Summary of Inverse Circular Functions, and it names the inverse function. It gives you its domain, and it gives you its range. It gives you the range in... Um, interval notation, and it also tells you the quadrants of the unit circle that your range value is allowed to come from. So take a look at that table. I think it's really, really helpful. Um, I think you should tab that page in your textbook or, um, and, or, and or even write out that table for yourself um, in your notes. It's really, really helpful. Okay, guys, let's do a couple more examples together, shall we? All right, we got we have example four, find the exact value of y if y is equal to inverse cosecant of negative root two. Now, if you refer back to the range for inverse cosecant, you'll find that it is between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. Now, if you are saying negative pi over two to positive pi over two, then your options are quadrant one or quadrant four, right? For uh, your y value. Now, please confirm what I'm saying here, okay? Don't take it for granted, but look up the range for inverse cosecant, and you'll find that uh, the range covers quadrants one and four. Now, the value they gave you is negative root two, so quadrant one is out, so it's going to have to be quadrant four, okay? So we can rewrite this statement, if you'd like, to mean um, the same thing as cosecant of y is negative root two. Now, if you know your unit circle really well, uh, you'll know that um, cosecant of 45 degrees in quadrant one, of course, cosecant of 45 degrees is root two, but in quadrant four, uh, within the proper range for inverse cosecant, you'll find that to be negative 45 degrees, okay? Negative 45 degrees. Make sure not, to not say 315 degrees because 315 degrees is not inside the range for inverse cosecant. Um, also, don't give an answer in quadrant three. Um, I know cosecant 
of, uh, what is it, 225 degrees is also negative root 2, but 225 degrees is not within the range of inverse cosecant. Cool deal. We have uh, theta is equal to inverse secant of 2. All right, so look at, uh, take a minute, please, to look at the range for inverse secant. Do you see that the range for inverse secant is from 0 to pi? Um, do you see that that means quadrant 1 or quadrant 2? Uh, because they gave us a positive value, uh, 2, we know that it cannot be quadrant number uh, 2. Because if it were quadrant 2, secant is negative in quadrant 2. And they didn't give us a negative value. They gave a positive value. So it's going to have to be quadrant 1. All right, cool deal. Um, now, we know that um, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So if I think about the reciprocal here, um, you know, we know that this means secant of theta is equal to 2. That must mean that cosine is a reciprocal of 2, right? Because secant and cosine are reciprocals. So cosine of theta would be 1 half. That helps me think about what angle this might be. So, um, so theta is going to have to be um, 60 degrees. Ooh, whoa, I don't know what that says. Okay, 60 degrees. All right, cool. Let me just box that. It's a weird looking box there, but okay, so we have it. Cool, deal. let's move on some more to uh, some more examples here to wrap this up. Okay, guys, example five, there'll be two parts. Um, part, <laughs> okay, excuse me. Let's start with part A, shall we? Not part B. Uh, let me erase that for us there. Uh, there we go. Let's start with part A. Um, now, the um, instructions say don't use a calculator, all right? So look at this. This is going to be a lot of fun. Cosine of uh, inverse sine of two-thirds, okay? Look at that expression. Now, this is what I'm going to recommend for the next few examples, is to make a substitution. So I'm going to say let theta or whatever else you want to call it, be this expression inside there. So let theta equal inverse sine of two-thirds. Okay, oh, that looks poorly written. Hold on just a second. Let me, let me uh, write that a little better here. Inverse um, sine of two-thirds. That's a little better. Now, um, with this... Uh, we know that this means, or this can be rewritten as sine of theta, that is to say, is two-thirds. Right, everybody? Now, do you remember the range for, in, for, for inverse sine? Right here it says theta is equal to inverse sine of two-thirds. The range, if I can remind you, the range for inverse sine is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. That is to say, quadrant 4 or quadrant 1. But because two-thirds is positive, I know we're going to have to be in quadrant one. So what you're going to see me do is draw what we call a reference triangle, okay, a reference triangle. I'm going to say this is theta, okay, and what we have is sine of theta is two-thirds. Remember sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So in order for sine of theta to be two over three, the opposite side would have to be two and the hypotenuse side would have to be 3. And then using the uh, Pythagorean theorem, we can find this adjacent side to theta to be the square root of 3 squared minus 2 squared. That is the square root of 9 minus 4, or the square root of uh, 5. Okay, that was using the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, cool. So all of this was kind of like um, I'm tempted to say kind of like scratch work here, okay, with our substitution, okay? Uh, we made a substitution, and then we drew a reference triangle. Please notice that pattern. We made a substitution, and then we drew our reference triangle. Now, with our substitution in here, let me use a different color just so you can see the original expression. This is now cosine of, remember, we called everything inside of here, I even underlined it, we called all of this theta. So then this is going to be cosine of theta. Now, look at your triangle that you created. 
the reference triangle, and tell me what cosine of theta is. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, but because you use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what that adjacent side is, which was the missing side for a second, you can actually say what cosine of theta is. It is root 5 over 3. This is the exact value of cosine of inverse sine of 2 thirds. It's root 5 over 3. Isn't that cool? So this is going to be our pattern. Um, make a substitution and then draw your reference triangle and then answer the question, all right? Let's try this again. All right, here's our next example. Secant of inverse cotangent of negative 15 eighths. Okay, guys, let's approach this the same kind of way. Um, let's let theta, or whatever else you want, whatever letter you want, represent this expression inside, all right? So I'm going to say let theta, let me see if I can write smaller this time, okay? Uh, let theta uh, represent uh, inverse cotangent of um, negative 15 eighths. Okay, now we know that inverse cotangents range is between 0 to pi. That's, that's quadrants 1 or 2. This must be quadrant 2, right, because they gave us a negative number. Did you follow that thinking right there? This value is negative, so that has to put us in quadrant 2 for inverse cotangent. Because your options are quadrant 1 or quadrant 2 when it comes to the range for inverse cotangent. Okay, now this is important when we draw our reference triangle. So we know that this statement means now that cotangent of theta is negative 15 eighths. So you're going to see me draw a reference triangle, but this time in quadrant number 2. So it has to look something like this, right guys? All right, so there's my theta, and cotangent is, let's see, what is that? That is adjacent over opposite, adjacent over opposite, adjacent over opposite. Um, I, the reason why I gave the negative to the 15 and not to the 8 is because I'm in quadrant 2, and in quadrant 2, it's your x values that are negative while your y values are positive. Okay, cool. By the Pythagorean theorem, we can find the length of the hypotenuse, right? To be the square root of 8 squared plus negative 15 squared. That is the square root of 64 plus um, 225. And so what is that? Uh, the square root of 289. So by the Pythagorean theorem, we can find that this side here is 17, okay? All right, everybody, now that we have our reference triangle, let me section this off if you don't mind. Hold on just a second. All right, this is kind of like scratch work, okay, everybody? That's scratch work. Now, I'm going to go back to my original statement, okay, everybody? This one right here. Um, with, the, with the substitution in, then this would mean secant of theta, right? Um, and now you can look at your reference triangle and tell me what secant of theta is. Remember, secant is a reciprocal of cosine. So it is going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. Hypotenuse over adjacent. We can just write that as negative 17 fifteenths. Okay? Cool deal. We, we found it. This is the exact value, and we found it without having to use a calculator. Again, the idea is make a substitution, draw your reference triangle very carefully in the correct, correct quadrant and all, and then you can answer the question. All right, I hope you guys are having as much fun as I am. I think this is really cool. All right, let's keep going. We're almost done. All right, guys, it's getting good now. Example six, evaluate without a calculator. Sign of arc tan of 4 thirds minus arc cosine of 12 thirteenths. All right, I'm going to stick to the same strategy, and that strategy is to make a substitution. But this time around, because I have a difference of terms inside of this group of parentheses, I have two different terms. That means I'm going to use two different uh, substitutions, all right? So I'm going to call this A, and I'm going to call, uh, let's see, this second one, I'll call that B, all right? So the first thing I'm going to say is, I'm going to say let uh, A, ah, that was a little, 
bigger a than I wanted, but it's okay. <laughs> Let a equal arctan of four thirds. Let's see if I can fit all this. And then let B uh, equal arc cosine, basically the other term, right, of 12 thirteenths, okay? All right, so we know that this would uh, imply that tangent of A is 4 thirds, while uh, cosine of B is 12 thirteenths. Okay, now let's draw our reference triangles. Now there's two of them. Uh, let's see, which quadrant am I going to draw this triangle? Well, the range for arctangent is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So your options are to draw a reference triangle in quadrant 4 or 1. Because 4 thirds is positive, I'll draw a reference triangle in quadrant 1. All right, so this is your angle A here. Ah, let me get this. Okay, angle A is right here, and we know tangent is opposite over adjacent, so it's 4 over 3. You can use the, the uh, Pythagorean theorem to find that this side is equal to 5. All right, now let's go to the other reference triangle. Now watch this. Uh, your range for arc cosine is uh, from 0 to pi. That means quadrants one or two. It's gonna to have to be quadrant one because this value is positive, all right? So let's draw a triangle, a reference triangle in quadrant one. Uh, this is your B, your angle B here. And we know cosine of B is 12 thirteenths. So this has to be 12 and then that has to be 13. By the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the opposite side of B has to be equal to the square root of 13 squared minus 12 squared. That is to say the square root of 169 minus 144. And then you can confirm, um, but I believe this gives us 5 here. Okay? Alrighty, everybody. What we can do now is, first of all, let me section this off from the rest of this. Uh, work here. So this is like my um, kind of like my scratch work here. I'm going to be looking at these triangles. Okay, now look at the original. Uh, the original uh, expression is sine of all of this stuff, okay? However, uh, with the substitutions in here, let me see if I can find a color that would pop out for you. This would be sine of we called this A minus, and then we called that B, didn't we? So now it's just sine of A minus B. But sine of A minus B, we have a difference identity for sine that will allow us to expand this as sine of A times cosine of B minus cosine of A times sine of B. So I don't know if you're getting this, but now all we have to do is reference our triangles and plug in sine of A, plug in cosine B, cosine A, sine B, and do this arithmetic here, and we found the value of this expression. So let's do that now. Okay, we have sine of A. Now, if you look at sine of A, sine of A is 4 fifths of B. I'm reading right down here, guys. Cosine of B, you have to come to this triangle over here. Cosine of B is 12 thirteenths. Look at the triangle, or you have the statement right here. So cosine of B is 12 thirteenths here. Cosine of A. Now, cosine of A is 3 fifths. Plug in sine of B. Sine of B is 5 thirteenths. 5 thirteenths. So I'm going to plug that in. So we got 4 fifths times cosine of let me plug that in. All right, we got some arithmetic there. Now minus, let's see what, so let's do that. Three fifths. And then finally, what we can do is, so let's plug five thirteenths in. All right, cool. All right, let's do this arithmetic and then we're done, everybody. So then this is 48 over 65 minus uh, 15 over 65. 
So then your final answer is simply uh, 33 over 65. Look at that. The um, This problem was really cool because, I mean, you made your substitution, uh, well, more than one substitution, right? You made two substitutions, you drew two different reference triangles in the appropriate quadrants. But it was extra cool, I think, because there was an extra layer, and that was you remembering and using the difference identity for signs. So I thought that was really cool. All right, let's do one more like this, okay? Example six, uh, part B. All right, sine of two times arc cotangent of negative five. I want to be. I want you to be careful about what substitution you make. I mean, if you look at all of the previous examples, we've been letting theta equal. I don't know, like everything inside the parentheses, you know, all of this. But I don't want you to let theta be everything within the parentheses. Just let theta be this much here. Oops, sorry. Let it just be this much right there. All right? So let theta, uh, let theta, you know what? Let me write, I think it would be smart if I write way down here, okay? Let theta uh, equal just arc cotangent of negative 5. Do you remember the range for arc cotangent? It's between 0 and pi, quadrants 1 and 2. This must be quadrant 2, right, everybody? Because they gave you a negative value. Uh, cotangent is indeed negative in quadrant 2. This would mean that cotangent of theta is negative fifths. Let uh, negative five, not negative fifths, negative five. Let's draw our reference triangle, okay, everybody? So this is our reference triangle in quadrant number two, okay? And we have an angle named theta, and we know cotangent, which is um, adjacent over opposite, is negative five. So then it's going to have to be, uh, let's see, in quadrant two, we're going to have five and then a negative one, right? Um, actually, I think I did that wrong, didn't I, everybody? Because adjacent over opposite would be negative one-fifth. I think I got that turned around. Can we switch those? Okay. There we go. All right, so we have negative five, like that, over one. Yeah, that's better because cotangent um, is adjacent over opposite. Now, by the Pythagorean theorem, you know that the uh, hypotenuse has to be the square root of 1 squared plus 5 squared. So the square root of 26, right, everybody? Cool. Can we section this off now, all of this here, and use it for our problem? Let's go back to our problem up here. So this is now sine of, now watch this, 2 theta. The reason why... Um, I think it was smart of us to just let this underlying piece be theta, is now we can use an identity, the double angle identity to be exact, um, for sine, which would say this is, do you remember it? Two times sine theta, cosine theta? Okay, and so this would be two times, now look at your angle, I'm sorry, not your angle, look at your triangle. What is sine of theta? One over root 26. So 1 over root 26. What is cosine of theta? Cosine of theta is negative 5 over root 26. So then this is, let's see, negative for sure. And then you have 10 in the numerator. And then root 26 times root 26 is just 26. So when you simplify, it'll by dividing by 2, you have negative 5 over 13 which is your final answer. Um, at the end of the day, folks, all of this right here is not a lot of work, but we just kind of had to set up, I think, you know, quite a bit of work in order to get that, all right? Cool deal, everybody. All right, guys, we made it to the last example in this section. They're gonna give you a trig expression, and they want you to write it as an algebraic expression. Now, they're telling you that u is positive, okay? u is positive. u is going to be your unknown. All right, cool. Here's the first trig expression that they're giving you. Cotangent of inverse secant of u. That is the trig expression. They want you to rewrite that as 
um, an algebraic expression. Okay, everybody, this is what I'm going to recommend you to um, make a substitution for, okay? So here we go. Um, let theta equal inverse secant of u. That would imply that secant of theta is equal to u. Um, you know, the range for inverse secant is from 0 to pi. I know we're going to have to be in quadrant 1 um, because they already told me that u is positive. If u was negative, then I would draw my reference triangle in quadrant number 2 because secant is negative in quadrant 2. But because they're telling me that u is positive, they're telling me that in the directions up here, I know I'm in quadrant 1. So that's why you're going to see me draw a triangle in quadrant 1. Now, I have to draw... That was a pretty poorly drawn triangle there. Let me do a better job of that. There. Um, we have to draw a triangle in quadrant 1 um, such that secant of theta is u. So if this is theta... Now remember, secant is um, hypotenuse over adjacent. Hypotenuse over adjacent. Hypotenuse over adjacent. Now, secant of theta is indeed, in this triangle, u, right? It would be u over 1. By the Pythagorean theorem, we'll find that this side um, has to be, the opposite side of theta would have to be the square root of u squared minus 1 squared, which is 1 squared is just 1. Okay? All right, so let's section all this off. This is what we'll reference, okay? Now let's go back to our problem. Um, okay, so with our um, substitution, we know this is cotangent of theta, right? Now all you got to do is look at your triangle and what is cotangent of theta. Cotangent, remember, is adjacent over hypotenuse. Oh, excuse me. No, it's not. Cotangent of theta is adjacent over opposite. That's what I should have said. Adjacent over opposite. So adjacent over opposite. And you have to be careful when you're writing this stuff and saying it as well. Uh, 1 over the square root of u squared minus 1. That, ladies and gentlemen, right there is an expression an algebraic expression. There is no trig function here, so it's just an algebraic expression in U. Now you're done, but I guess just to simplify this a little bit, we should we should be good to um, rationalize. Do you remember how you would rationalize? You would rationalize by multiplying by the square root of U squared minus 1. Rationalize just means that you want to rewrite this expression so that there's no radical in the uh, denominator. So then your final answer would be the uh, square root of u squared minus 1 over just u squared minus 1. This is an algebraic expression in u. Isn't that great? Good job, everybody. Let's do one more just like this, and then that will wrap up this section for us. Okay, guys. Last example for the section. Kind of sad about it, but um, here we go. Sine of 2 times inverse cosine of u. Now remember, this is a trig expression, um, and they want an algebraic expression in u. And u is positive. All right, let's get to it. Let's make a substitution. Um, this one looks similar to another one that you and I worked on, right? So let's make a substitution for inverse cosine of u, okay? So let theta, I always choose theta, it doesn't have to be theta. Here, I'll change it. Let beta, okay, it doesn't have to be theta. Let beta be inverse cosine of u. Okay, that would mean that cosine of beta um, is equal to u. Now, you can draw, because of the range for inverse cosine, you can draw a reference triangle in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. However, because they told you that u is positive in the instructions, um, you have to draw it in quadrant 1. Okay? So here's quadrant 1, a, tr a triangle in quadrant 1, and here's beta, okay? And we know that cosine of beta is u. Okay, so that means uh, this would have to be u, and then this would have to be 1. 
right? That way cosine of beta is adjacent over hypotenuse, which is u over 1, which is just u. By the Pythagorean theorem, that would make this the square root of 1 minus u squared, okay? All right, everybody, section that off. And now go back up here to your work. And so this would now be uh, mean sine of 2 beta, right? And um, we just used this double lingual identity um, a few minutes ago. It would be 2 times sine beta times cosine beta. But now you can just reference your triangle. Sine of beta is uh, one the square root of 1 minus u squared. Ah, there, <laughs> over 1. Um, times cosine of beta, which is um, u, okay? So then your final answer is 2u times the square root of 1 minus u squared, okay? This is your final answer. This is an, an uh, expression, algebraic expression in u. Cool? So these last few examples, again, this, the process was make a substitution. Be careful about your substitution. Um, and then draw your reference triangle. Use an identity if you have to. Some of them we did, and some uh, we did, and some of, uh, of the others we did not have to use an identity. Um, and then um, using your reference triangle, answer the question. All right. Um, this was a lengthy section, everybody. Um, so, um, the, but it's finally done. So six point one is done. I'll catch you in the next video, which will be six point two entitled Trig Equations Part 1. There'll be uh, multiple parts, but it'll be Trig Equations Part 1 in 6.2, the next video, and that's where I'll catch you. All right, everybody, good luck, and I'll see you then.